measurements. So it's not as big as, as the, um, uh, that one there that, uh, that Van has that is like, you know, three letters per page uh, type, <laughs> type, of, type of print. Not quite that big, uh, but it is definitely readable for someone uh, my age and just, oh, that, that's, uh, there's a smell there that uh, if, you, if you do not appreciate that, I'm not sure we want you here tonight. Uh, that's the seller is to it. Um, so, so uh, yeah, I just got this. He, he made it for me. I picked it up at G3. And uh, the name on it says Reformed Biblicist. So that tells you where that one's coming from. And some of you know the background on that one. Uh, but I brought that especially for you all. And if you're really, really nice, I might let you touch it. Um, I'm not really sure. We'll, we'll see. I'll check your hands uh, before you, you do so. And, uh, uh, but you know, I was looking recently. I still have my first two Bibles. Uh, I have them in my library. My first Bible was that, and let's see how many, how old some of you are. My first Bible um, would drive a lot of reform folks crazy. They'd call it a uh, uh, second commandment violation uh, because it has all these paintings and pictures in it. And it's got Jesus on the front with the little children around him, you know, and it's a, it's a zipper up one. But being a good independent fundamentalist Baptist, it's in the King James. <laughs> so that may rescue it a little bit uh, as far as that's concerned. And it's pretty beat up, but I've, I've still got it. And it's still got all the little stickers that I would, I would win in Sunday school classes, you know, and stuff like that for memorizing a verse or who knows, whatever, uh, keeping my crayon within the, the lines or something. I'm, I'm not sure why I got them, but I still have that. And then I have my second Bible, which was my big boy's Bible, which was a brown leather King James, um, red letter edition, uh, obviously way too small for me to even read any of it anymore, but uh, I still have them. And in, in fact, there's, there's almost no Bibles that I've had during my life that I don't actually still have. I'm not sure what my grandkids are gonna do with all this stuff, to be honest with you. But, um, and part of it was, I'm very thankful that um, though there are aspects of my upbringing that I have moved away from, uh, or I, I've, I've come to realize were, had traditions in them that we, you know, I, I was raised to think that we didn't have any traditions, and uh, everybody else had the traditions, and we didn't. Well, no, we, we did. Uh, I mean, uh, how many of you ever uh, did the New Year's Eve thing where you'd stay up till midnight? Remember, remember that? What, what did they call that? Watch night. That's right. New Year's Eve watch night. And in fact, how many of you ever did a New Year's Eve watch night and you watched A Thief in the Night? <laughs> that will warp you. Uh, okay, that, that has a permanent long-term impact on you. It really does. How many of you have not seen A Thief in the Night? <laughs> What's that? We talk about it all the time in my Sunday school before we were Yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness. Um, okay, let, let me turn that around. How many of you have seen A Thief in the Night? That's actually, wow. Wow. Okay, I'm amazed. Um, no matter what your uh, eschatological perspective is, <coughs> I would highly recommend just simply for cultural reasons um, to, to watch A Thief in the Night. When that camera, when the rapture happens, that'll tell you where this is coming, when the rapture happens and the, the camera, there's this guy out there and he's mowing the lawn, you know, and the, and the camera goes up to the sky and you're going, am I going to see anything? No. And it comes back down and there's the lawnmower and it's just running alone. <laughs> You know, uh, I mean, I'm getting goosebumps right now. I mean, <laughs> I'm going to tell you. <laughs> there, there were people getting converted just, they didn't know what they were converting to, but they didn't want, <laughs> didn't want that, they didn't want to get left behind. They wonder wonder where that one came from. Um, yeah, oh goodness. Uh, but, so, I think about all that stuff. 
But one of the things that was communicated to me, now we didn't ever do the, well, you never put a Bible under another book type thing or stuff like that, or there is some people do that. But we had a real respect. I had a real respect for the Bible as the Word of God. Now, uh, my dad was a graduate of Moody Bible Institute. He uh, studied under Kenneth Wiest, if any of you, they called him Skipper Wiest. Um, they called him Skipper of the Good Ship Greek. He was the Greek professor at Moody in the 1950s when my dad was there. And um, uh, I've probably told you the story. After, actually, over 23 years, I'm not even going to bother saying I've probably told you the story before because I have. <laughs> it's just, uh, but there's only, there's only a few of you who have been here all those years. Um, Van's had so many surgeries since then, he doesn't remember what I've said, so he's, he's, he's cool. Um, and you've been here, and I just figure you'd just smile at me and, and listen to all the stories over and over again. Um, uh, repetition is the mother of memory, as uh, they say in Latin, actually. So anyway, um, now, you, now you see what happens there? I was going to tell you a really funny story, and, and I just went off on that, on that thing, and I, and I missed it. Anyway, um, we were given a, a deep-seated trust in the Word of God. And, uh, oh, it's Kenneth Wiest, sorry, and Kenneth Wiest. Kenneth Wiest was, it was said that Kenneth Wiest sent more men to the mission field than anyone else at Moody Bible Institute. Why? Because in those days, there were two tracks at Moody. There was the pastoral track and the missions track. For the pastoral track, you had to take his Greek class. And for the missions track, you didn't. <laughs> and so, he sent a lot of men to the mission field. Um, <laughs> And uh, I, I'm not sure he appreciated that, but what it meant was he was, he was uh, pretty, pretty tough. He was pretty strict. And so I remember, it's amazing how the mind works, the memories. Um, I, rem I will remember things that my dad said in classes that he was teaching that I, I had to sit in there because he was dad and but it was adults and I wasn't expected really to be listening oh they do listen <laughs> and it's amazing the things they hear and I picked things up from him so I wasn't in one of those churches where it was just you know surface surface level stuff which unfortunately does happen uh, I was given an appreciation of where scripture came from but I didn't really understand how we got it. And I remember it was really in my teenage years, we were at a Southern Baptist church. We joined a very, very large, once we moved to Arizona, we joined a very large Southern Baptist church. And I don't know why, again, I remember one day in a sermon, the pastor saying, now the, the Greek for this phrase is this. And I remember asking myself, why do we care what the Greeks think? <laughs> I don't even like their food, so why, you know. <laughs> and, and that's when you started uh, asking questions. I mean, uh, we had a television ministry there. And I worked in the television ministry. I ran a camera, did television engineering, stuff like that. Learned a lot. It was, it, was, it was good for me. But I remember we were having a Bible study class in, amongst the TV crew. And someone asked a question about the Trinity. And quite honestly, we were turning to the concordance in our Bible to try to find passages on the Trinity. We didn't know, um, you know, what was, were you there? I think you were. I think you were, because it was up in it was up in the uh, yeah. Uh, my my friend Alan Willis is here. Good to see you, brother. Um, we we missed you at our 40th uh, anniversary, uh, but I I hoped I'd get to see you here. Um, uh, the first time, <laughs> the first time we went to Salt Lake City. The first time Alpha and Omega Ministries went to Salt Lake City to pass out tracks at the General Conference, we took his car. And some idiot um, hit it at a gas station while pulling out uh, on our way back. Uh, somehow we got back in one piece. Because uh, you remember what we did? We drove up Friday night, passed out tracks all day Saturday, drove back Saturday night and got back in ch time in church Sunday morning. That's called suicide, uh, okay? Um, but you were young enough to let us do it, and we did it anyways. Uh, and so, wow, 
Lots of memories we could, uh, we could talk about there. But we, were, we literally did not know enough about the Trinity to realize that the term was not in the New Testament. We're sitting there looking at a concordance. Try, and we're wondering, why T-T-R, well, where's, where's Trinity? I mean, it, there's got to be a verse on the Trinity somewhere in the Bible. That's where we were. And so everybody goes through a process of maturation and, and learning and, and, and things along those lines. But some people, if you remember the emergent church movement, the emergent church movement was made up of fundamentalists who all of a sudden realized that they had bought a lot of tradition. And so what they do is they throw everything out and start from scratch. And I understand that temptation. I mean, the Trinity, you know, basically theism, everything. You start from scratch. And, and I never went through that, thankfully. Um, I think all of us have to go through a, a process of maturing to where we take the faith that has been sort of given to us in our youth or in our, you know, or if we were converted as an adult in those early years, and we make that faith our own. And just experiencing life, death, ministry in the church, uh, that will do a lot of that for you. That's why we have to, that's why we need to be in a church, not doing electronic church and stuff like that. We need to be amongst the brethren and sistren um, you know, uh, I'm sitting here thinking about a lot of the, the theological battles that I'm, I'm battling right now. And then I realized it was only two weeks ago tomorrow that uh, we got a call from a young couple in our, in our fellowship. She was two weeks past due. And we had... Apologia is being fruitful and multiplying and filling the earth. I can assure you of that. I mean, the, the number of pregnant ladies that we have, uh, the number of kids we have, we have two families and both moms are working on number 11 at the same time. Um, so yeah, uh, we, we've, we, baby showers are us. It's just, uh, that's the way it is. But um, she was two weeks past due. She, she was going to a birthing center. They go into the birthing center and um, uh, baby goes into distress. And at the birthing center, they can't do a C-section. And so they um, do an emergency thing uh, to the hospital. I'm sure with her approval, they did an emergency C-section. And when I say emergency C-section, without anesthesia. Still lost the baby. And I was the first one to the hospital. The baby was still there. They're holding the baby. Um, two weeks passed, so we're, we're talking a fully developed child here named James. And you, you experience that kind of life in the church, and it, you have to mature. Your, your, your foundations have to either get deeper or what's the, what's the popular term today on the internet? You will deconstruct. Which is, the old word was, you'll become an apostate, but now you just deconstruct. Um, one of those two things is gonna happen. You can't just stay in apathy or just you know, in one, one level. You're gonna have to either get deeper or something else. In all of those things, and. If any of you are pastors, if you've been involved in ministry now, I mean, I've been, I was ordained in 85, I think, something like that, coming up on 40 years. And so I've done a lot of funerals. I've been in a lot of hospital rooms. I was a hospital chaplain for two and a half years. Um, seen a lot of that stuff. And I'm glad that I did. By the way, I think it's vitally important. I, I feel for anybody who does theology or apologetics or anything like that, that is not a churchman. That's why people end up wandering off into weird heresies, because they're not rooted in the life of the church. Uh, and that's just something we've always been very much uh, focused upon. But through all of that, um, I, and I mean, I've, I've debated atheists, I've debated Muslims, um, most of my debates are, yeah, with religious people, okay? I, that's, that's primarily the area. 
But many of those religious people would say, this is not enough. That this brings confusion in and of itself. It needs to have all sorts of other things. And this teaches me that we're to have a church. And it teaches me that there are uh, offices in the church. There's the elders, and there's the deacons, and there's a ministry of teaching. And I'm professor of church history at Grace Bible Theological Seminary, church history and apologetics. And so I've taught church, the first class I taught after I graduated from seminary was church history, and I've been teaching it on and off. I'm teaching it for a church in Germany. Uh, still, I was teaching it last year when I was here. I'm sure I mentioned it. And uh, we, we keep meeting every month, and we keep, we're only up to Augustine, for crying out loud, these poor people. I mean, uh, it, it, I'm not sure, I, I, I will be history before we, te we finish church history. That, that's what I've been saying, and it's true. But I, I fully understand that we stand on the shoulders of giants, that the terminology we use, the language we use, has been formed and developed over millennia. Um, that there have been brilliant men in the past. But I also recognize that no matter how brilliant they were, the ultimate standard by which their teaching is to be judged is found in Scripture. And if you believe that, there are necessary ramifications from that. And you need to understand that if you believe that, you are in a minority. And you may believe it, but you may not recognize just how much work is required to make application consistently of what you say you believe. And in fact, in my experience, being pressed by someone like myself, I, I consider it part of my job. As a professor, as a pastor, as a teacher, it's my job. Uh, when, I, when I taught systematic theology for Golden Gate for years, uh, or Christian apologetics, or whatever, um, I would tell my students at the beginning of the semester, my job is to step on your theological toes. Um, if you're not challenged in this class, you've wasted your money, and I've wasted your time. I only ask you to be consistent in your responses. I'm not asking you to agree with everything I say. I only ask you to be consistent in how you respond to the materials I present to you. But all of that meant testing our traditions and what we believe. And a lot of people get really, very, really, really, really uncomfortable when their, tra their traditions are put on the table. And I've used the illustration here many times before. We, we live in a day, and we have lived in a day, and now society around us is forcing us to start changing this, but I grew up in the 70s and 80s, and at that time, at least in the, in where I was, we functioned on the basis of the idea that we could have neutrality. We could have neutrality with the world. We could have our religious world, and we could uh, read our Bibles and have our spiritual life, and then we could walk out the door and we could be in a, in a neutral world where everybody's just going to get along, but you don't necessarily have to bring along any of the presuppositions that you have in the religious world. And I, I call that today the myth of neutrality, because it is a myth. It, it actually does not make any sense when you think about it, but that's how we lived. And since we lived that way, we could have our theologies of truth separated from one another. So we could have our, our doctrine of God over here and our doctrine of salvation over here. And it was very rare that you would ever have to bring them close enough to find out if they were consistent with each other. And we didn't really mind. 
because we weren't being forced to find out if our doctrine of God was consistent with our doctrine of salvation. And of course, we have the doctrine of the church, if we even had a doctrine of the church. I remember clearly uh, teaching a, a Sis Theo class for, for Golden Gate somewhere in the late 90s, early 2000s, I think. We met at Grand Canyon College at the time. And this student came up to me after a class and he was like, you were talking about all the New Testament passages that say that there's a plurality of elders in the church. Um, you know, it, they went around ordaining elders in the churches, not an elder uh, who was then hired by a deacon board, <laughs> you know, because that, that's sort of how we did it and the way I was raised. And we, we, he said, I've read all those passages. I had never seen it. I've never even heard a sermon on it. And I had a lot of students, and I understood that that's what the class is for. It's to make you think those things through. But it does make you go, how, how imbalanced has my theological education been? Um, and why don't we have sermons on the whole counsel of God? Why, why haven't we talked about these things? So most people didn't even have a, a, a doctrine of, of the church. And, of course, I have to embarrassingly admit um, that when it comes to eschatology, I was, you know how I was raised when I was watching A Thief in the Night, okay? You, you, know, you know where that came from. But it only took about two years in Bible college with uh, professors who were amillennialists and I was already de starting to deal with Mormonism at this time, um, for me to realize, you know, the, the exegetical argumentation I use in dealing with the Mormons and the doctrine of God, stuff like that, it, it's not quite the same that you use for a lot of this eschatology stuff that I believe. And, and so it didn't take me very long to go, you know what, I'm not really sure. Which in itself was an act of apostasy in a lot of the churches that I grew up in. I mean, let me tell you, I mean, when you've got those churches and they will anathematize each other for being mid-trib or post-trib or pre-trib, uh, th then if you go, I'm not really sure, wow, you're not even a Christian. <laughs> no, I mean it. I mean it. I, I mean it. The churches I was raised in, if you were anything but pre-mill, pre-trib, all the rest of those perspectives were clearly inspired by Satan and you're going to hell. Um, <laughs> And, and I'm, I'm not making that up. That's, that's the way it was. And so for a long time, I mistakenly called myself a pan-millennialist. It'll all pan out in the end, you know? <laughs> By the way, personal, personal warning here. If you're ever sitting directly next to John MacArthur and he asks you what your eschatological view is, do not call yourself a pan-millennialist, okay? <laughs> That look could melt steel. It really, really could. Um, I'm still, I still wake up in the middle of the night with cold, <laughs> cold shivers from that because I experienced it at the Christian Booksellers Association convention in 1995. Yeah. Um, eventually, I did the easy thing uh, and, uh, uh, and then said, okay, I'm, uh, I, I listened to a series of uh, tapes. Tapes. Anyone remember tapes? Tapes? Remember tapes? Good. Okay. Um, member tapes, so oh, just uh, Kelly ran those big old machines at North Phoenix, making all those tapes. Uh, so so long, long ago. Anyway, um, I'm, I got to stop doing that to poor Alan. It's going to keep you awake though, uh, because every time, remember that? Okay, good. See, and if you're drifting, then you're you're, you're in d big trouble. Anyway, uh, uh, I listened to some a series of tapes that yeah, that makes sense. And so okay, I'm an amillennialist, but I'm not going to talk about it. And I was not a passionate amillennialist by any stretch of the imagination. And most of you probably know that about two and a half years ago, uh, Jeff Durbin and, uh, got to me, as everybody says. And, and now I'm one of the dreaded post-millennialists. Uh, so I've been everywhere R.C. Sproul was. Did you all know that? R.C. Sproul was a premillennialist, and he was an amillennialist, and he ended up as a post-millennialist. So 
Uh, and of course, postmillennialists say that once everybody dies, they end up as a postmillennialist too. So um, that's just sort of how it works. Uh, but eschatology was just, that was just, eschatology was something that was back in that back corner. It had nothing to do with soteriology or the church or what the church is to be doing in this life or anything like that. But guess what? The last couple of years has made a lot of us go, huh. Oh. I've, I'm being challenged about things I've never even thought of before. Because we were living in the myth of neutrality. And all of a sudden we realize this world is not neutral to the claims of Christ. <laughs> this government is not neutral to the claims of Christ. When you can lose your job for misgendering someone, um, when Jesus in Matthew chapter 19 said from the beginning the Creator made them male and female, I mean, it's, it's right there. And so this world is not in any way, shape, or form neutral uh, toward the, the claims of Christ. And we're seeing it more and more and more. And what that's forcing us to do is to take all these areas of our theology and bring them much closer so that they, are, they have coherence and consistency with one another. And that can be very uncomfortable can be very uncomfortable and people can actually get rather angry when you force them to do that. But what's at the foundation of all of this? At least for me, I am very, very thankful that there has not been as a part of this um, challenging evaluation of the consistency of my worldview and my application and my faith and everything else that has never involved questioning that this is a divine revelation from God. Now, don't sit there and go, well, congratulations, because in reality, if we're talking about sola scriptura, we have to start with the recognition that if you believe that these 66 books, not 74, um, these and I'm probably going to be having to address that topic again uh, in upcoming debates in, in uh, February and March. These 66 books are unique and are consistent with themselves. That there is a overall harmony, not a surface level, you know, you know I was, and I, I got this from my, my dad, and uh, he's gone now, um, but um, you, you knew that, didn't you? Yeah, February of uh, 22, 22, yeah, February, February 2nd, 22. Um, I, I did get this from my dad, and this was a fundamentalistic uh, methodology, uh, methodology of interpretation. I remember him clearly saying, um, you look at the first appearance of a word in Scripture, and that will always determine how that word is going to be used after that in the Bible. How many of you have ever heard that before? Just a few of you. Okay, that's good. <laughs> uh, because it's not true. Um, but it is a fundamentalistic methodology of interpretation that creates, uh, it, it's sort of a Strong's Exhaustive Concordance type thing. Hey, Eric, how you doing over there? Sorry, I, I'm just, same row, too. Uh, but the, the glow from Alan's head was uh, making it hard for you to see that you're, you're in the dark there. Hey, I got nothing to talk about, you know. Um, uh, we knew each other when we both had full heads of hair. It was, it was wonderful and great. Anyways, um, that, it, it, the, the harmony and unity of this collection of books of Scripture, which becomes a single body of Scripture, is not some surface level thing. It's, it, it, it's not forcing it uh, to be consistent with itself on a, on a simplistic level. Um, I was really forced to think through these issues uh, about 15 years ago when I taught through the Synoptic Gospels at the church I was at at the time, Phoenix Reformed Baptist Church. And I taught through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all the way through. And if you do that using a harmony of the Gospels, where you've got each of the stories right next to it, you can't avoid the fact that they don't exactly say the exact same thing. <laughs> and in fact, if they did, why do we have them anyways, if they were the exact same wording and stuff like that? And so I had to dig deep 
Um, not only for that, but, you know, I do debates with Muslims and, and other unbelievers and things like that. And, and, and in fact, in God's providence, when I first debated Shabir Ali at Biola University in 2006, um, that was one of his favorite things to do to Christians, was to hit them with alleged contradictions from the Synoptic Gospels. And the one he tried to hit me with that night, I had just taught on like two weeks earlier at PRBC. It was great. I mean, I didn't even have to look at, look at the text. It's like, boom, oh, hmm. I, he was, wasn't sure what to do about that. So, um, so you're not talking about a, a simplistic harmonization. The, the consistency exists on a deep, beautiful level. When you think about it, you're talking about uh, 1,400, 1,500 years. Um, multiple languages. Hebrew develops during that period of time. You've got a few chapters in Aramaic. Uh, Koine Greek, and even then you've got different styles of Greek in the New Testament. Luke's completely different than John, for example. Um, you've got at least 40 different authors, some of which we do not know. And yet, the themes that are laid out in Genesis are purposefully fulfilled in Revelation. And they are found throughout the Gospels, and they are found in beautiful, and all through the Psalter in, in, in amazing ways. And so, if you believe that this is a consistent volume, that that if we have a doctrinal belief, it needs to be consistent with what Scripture says from beginning to end. You need to understand something. In what calls itself Christendom, you are in a very small minority. You are in a very small minority. And if you've been raised in a, in a good Bible-believing church and, and you haven't had to go out from that into other areas, you might be surprised by that because well, that's how we've always done things. And yeah, I understand that. But if you go to almost any theological seminary, with very few exceptions today, vast majority of Bible colleges, certainly all the mainstream denomination, mainstream, main, quote unquote, mainline, uh, which just simply means the line that's going straight into the abyss. Um, <laughs> Uh, they won't be in existence in 30 years anyways, but uh, the quote-unquote mainline denominations, that is not what is believed. And if during June, which by the way is coming again uh, in six months, um, you get sick and tired of seeing female preachers with rainbow stoles around their necks saying things about Scripture that you just go... That's not even close. What are these, what is these people thinking? There's a reason for that. If you, if you got the theological education that they've gotten, you'd understand why they're saying the things they're saying. We are in the minority. And as we are in the minority, uh, we need to um, have an extremely firm foundation for believing what we believe about Scripture. So when, we, when you see the, the church's brand new sign out there, did y'all see the brand new sign? They were having, they were having uh, training uh, for the brand new sign stuff. And I said, I really hope you have a very strong password on that thing because uh, there are people that would just love to put some really strange things on, on signs like that. Um, but uh, as you look at the sign, we're talking about sola scriptura. Well, guess what? That's not the first time we've discussed that here. In fact, I've lost count. Did you happen to look back over? I mean, do we even keep records? No, he's sitting there going, nah. <laughs> nah. I, gotta, I got more important. I, at, at our age, you don't waste your time on stuff like that because you only got so much time left. Um, I hear you, but it, it's got to be at least the third time in that amount of time. It's got to be at least the third time that we have covered Sola Scriptura. And I was thinking about the fact that undoubtedly the first time we covered this, my focus and emphasis, because of what I was debating and doing at that particular period of time, would have been on sola scriptura as the key issue in debating Roman Catholicism. Because if you, if you talk to Roman Catholics who are into Catholic apologetics, 
uh, and are seeking to convert you. They're, we're in a season where once again, it, it sort of goes up and down, but we're in a season where we're seeing lots of converts to either Roman Catholicism, which makes no sense because of Francis. I'll be perfectly honest with you. I would think this would be the worst time, uh, given that Francis is demonstrating beyond all question that when you abandon Sola Scriptura, this is what you're left with. I mean, he's changing teachings in the church that have been in the Roman Catholic Church for 1,600 years. So this stuff about tradition and apostolic tradition, all the rest of that stuff, it's being disproven right in front of everybody's faces. But still, um, there, you know, people are converting to Roman Catholicism. In fact, I mentioned on the dividing line, um, was it yesterday? Uh, one of the last two dividing lines I did. Uh, how many of you remember the uh, DVD back in the mid, probably like 2005, 2006 area, somewhere around there, called Amazing Grace? Uh, the history and character of Calvinism and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, the guy that produced it and narrated it has become Roman Catholic. And so I responded to a little article that he had uh, written uh, recently about, um, you know, aspects in regards to the gospel and stuff like that. But, you know, there's, there's an example. And right now, interestingly enough, what's gotten a lot of people's attention, maybe because of Francis, actually, is Eastern Orthodoxy. And there's all sorts of folks that are attracted to the liturgy and uh, the beautiful music. I mean, have you ever listened to a CD of Gregorian chants? It's, it's astonishing. I mean, it's beautiful, beautiful stuff. Um, and you've got the smells and the bells and every service is three hours long uh, and you stand for almost all of it. I mean, that's enough to earn you something in heaven, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> now, of course, Eastern Orthodoxy in the West is not Eastern Orthodoxy in the East. And I used to travel to Ukraine all the time, and um, uh, you, you'd see real Eastern Orthodoxy, nominal Eastern Orthodoxy, political Eastern Orthodoxy in places like Ukraine and Russia and stuff like that. Um, so here in the, in the West, it takes on a different flavor, I guess. But you see people converting. And both of those groups fundamentally deny Sola Scriptura. And in fact, they will say it's absolutely dangerous to believe that the scriptures are the sole infallible rule of faith because Christ has given us not only the church, which of course they define very differently from each other even, um, but he's given us... And Roman Catholicism has a very specific definition in these senses, and Eastern Orthodoxy is much more nebulous and mysterious, but he's given us tradition. And if you have the Bible separated from church and tradition, you end up with this, well, you end up with TBN. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, if, if, if you just put it in a, in a simple fashion. Um, you end up with the wild craziness that we see um, all over the place today. No restraints, no connections with history, um, and all the strange teachings and heresies and everything else. And it's due to divorcing or separating the scriptures from the great tradition of the church, from sacred tradition, oral tradition, it all depends on which group you're talking to and how they interpret things. Rome has, like I said, they talk about sacred tradition and then subsumed under sacred tradition is oral tradition and written tradition. Written tradition is the scripture. Oral tradition is whatever they say it is. I mean, that's how it works. They, they, they wouldn't express it that way, but that's how it's worked over history. It's whatever we say it is. We won't tell you what it is until we define a dogma based upon it. And then the Eastern Orthodox likewise have that tradition, but that tradition is embodied in the liturgy and prayers of the church. Which, again, there's different brands and flavors there and different interpretations of those things as well. So it's a bit of a challenge to uh, deal with that. But that's the argument. And there are a lot of people accepting it. 
And uh, last year, I believe, when I was here, we talked a little bit about the movement going on even within reform circles that is emphasizing the need uh, to be, to do exegesis within the great tradition. Now, the problem is who gets to define what the great tradition is. Um, but all of it, fundamentally, the danger is, is scripture by its nature fundamentally different than anything else? Or is it similar to what we have in tradition and therefore to be put in the same, in the same categories? And how do we balance the reality that we live 2,000 years after the birth of Christ? And it would be, obviously, arrogance on our part to reinvent the wheel with every generation. Right? I mean, Christ said he's going to build his church. Do we believe that he has been? Then that means the Holy Spirit has been active. Okay, then we can learn from those who came before us. But what do we learn from those who came before us? There was a professor, maybe some of you remember the name, I think it, was it Calhoun? He was at Covenant Seminary. My fellow elder at PRBC was a graduate of Covenant, and even he went, well, there's the Old Covenant Seminary and there's the New Covenant Seminary. And he made a distinction. Um, but I think he taught at Covenant ages ago. He taught church history. And they put all of his class lectures on what used to be called iTunes U. I'm not sure if they even have it anymore, uh, but it was really useful. And I enjoyed listening to them. They were very good. <coughs> and he would, at the end of each class, he would either quote a verse that was sort of upbeat and thankful for what we've learned from the past, or he'd have a verse that was sort of like, Lord, help us to learn from the mistakes of those who came before us, okay? And sometimes you really didn't know which one to quote. It was, it was, it was a mixed bag. So what do we learn is the question. Um, can we learn positive things? Yes. But we also have to recognize um, that, for example, in the West, for 1,100 years, the Bible, the church, was the Latin Vulgate. It wasn't even in the language of, the, of many of the peoples of Europe, but that was the standard. And... When I teach church history, and we've done church history sessions here uh, over those 23 years, when I teach church history, I try to teach my students, you need to recognize that we need to read those who came before us in the context in which they ministered. And so we cannot, it, it's, what we always want to do is we want to ask our current debate questions of them in the past, because we want to be able to say, well, Augustine agreed with me, and uh, uh, Gregory agreed with me, and that, that's somehow supposed to help you win the debate. That's very frequently unfair. Uh, when you look at the earliest fathers, for example, when you look at a um, Justin Martyr, Justin doesn't even have the entire New Testament. What would your theology look like if you did not have a, a major portion of Paul? And in fact, if you didn't have a major portion of Paul, if you're anywhere near Orthodox, well, congratulations to you. You're better off than most of the rest of us. Seriously, I mean, give them a, give them a salute. And so you have those early periods, and then, and then later on, very early, you start seeing the influences of things outside of Scripture that, that end up having long-term impact. I mean, we talk all the time about Augustine. We quote Augustine. You read Calvin. Calvin reads August, quotes Augustine more than anybody else. 
Okay. But if you read Augustine, you'll be reading along and you'll be going, oh, yeah, that's great, that's super. And then you turn the page and, you, and it's like someone just hung a left. <laughs> And he's talking about numerology, and I mean, boy, when he explains like Christmas, ooh, wow, uh, it gets really weird with these numbers. You put numbers together and stuff like that, and you're just going, where did this come from? And then you turn the page, and we're back to normal again. And it's like, okay, all right, well, no. And, and, and you do this with everybody, um, even Chrysostom. Uh, Calvin wanted to write a commentary on some of Chrysostom's sermons. He got the preface written, but he never got, got to finish the work. And in that preface, uh, he, he talks about how he just has tremendous respect for, for Chrysostom. He was, just one of the, he was the greatest preacher of the ancient church. There's no question about all that. But, he says, but he must be read as a man of his age, and he must be, must be compared with the teaching of Scripture. And on certain subjects, he clearly had false ideas. And... That's how we have to work with everybody, including Calvin, for that matter. Um, that's, that's the standard we have to have. But Augustine, for example, was a Neoplatonist. And you cannot escape the fact that his theological formulations are deeply influenced by Neoplatonism. Now, the apostles were not Neoplatonists. And so if you take the apostles' teachings and try to express them in the terminology of Neoplatonism, you're going to end up creating emphases that weren't there originally and muting emphases that were. And so it, it is a necessary ongoing process for the church to be examining everything that's come before, take the good, get rid of the bad. The problem is we love our traditions. And we tend to idolize men of the past. And I see right, I, I, I experience it all the time. I'm seeing right now amongst reformed men this uh, idolization of forms of tradition. Part of it has to do with getting ahead in the academic world, but we won't get into that right now. What does all that have to do with Sola Scriptura? Well, what does Sola Scriptura mean? And as I would have defined it, and I would still define it the same way, but as I would have defined it when we first did this, and I think it was one of the first two or three subjects we did um, in this long series that we've been doing, Scripture is the sole infallible rule of faith for the church. It does not mean we do not have other rules of faith. It does not mean we cannot have uh, confessions of faith. It does not mean we cannot have subordinate rules. Uh, it does not mean that we cannot uh, benefit uh, from uh, church councils uh, or from uh, denominations getting together and hashing things out and learning from other people. It doesn't mean any of those things. What it does mean is that the scriptures are an infallible rule of faith given to the church for a specific purpose. And the only way to believe that is if you believe that there is something special about the nature of the scriptures. And I'm sure you've heard uh, people use the original Greek term found in 2 Timothy 3, where Paul describes the scriptures as theonoustos, God-breathed. And uh, whenever I say that from this pulpit, Brother Ken breaks out in a sweat. Um, I don't really think this actually happened. I think this is sort of uh, a bit of an exaggeration on, on Brother Ken's part. But he swears that uh, like the first time he ever showed up for this stuff. You've heard the story before? Oh, yeah. Um, that he dared ask a question during the Q&A at the end. Um, and it was about inspiration. And according to him, what I did, now this is, not, this is just not how I am. So that's why I, I know that this is an exaggeration, you know, something. You know, Ken's getting up there, you know, a little bit, in, in the, a little long in the tooth, even older than I am. And, and uh, 
uh, he, he says, I looked at him and I go, so you've not read B.B. Warfield's article on the meaning of Theonustos? You need to go read that right now. And that I made him feel badly, like he was, you know, like a, a bumpkin or something like that. And then he, he goes and finds the article and it's like half in German, half in Latin, you know, and <laughs> stuff like this. And, and he just sort of figured, well, uh, that guy has no idea what he's talking about. And, um, uh, but the, the, the reality is that, that Warfield's article is still extremely useful today. And one of the reasons I can tell it's extremely useful is the number of people that are trying to refute it now. And if, what's really interesting is um, a man that I'll be debating on Sola Scriptura and Purgatory, two nights in a row in Houston, um, in, right in the middle of, of February. A man by the name of Trent Horn from Catholic Answers. Um, Trent Horn, uh, in a debate last year, quoted from a book. The book has not been widely uh, reviewed or even uh, received much in the way of any kind of scholarly attention, but he dug it out somewhere. And the thesis of this particular book is that Theanustos does not mean God breathed. It does not mean has its origin in God, but that Theanustos means life-giving. Now, you can sort of see how you could, you know, Theanustos, Theos, Neustos, spirit breathed, God breathes life. You can sort of see sort of a, oh, I, I can, okay, might have sort of that kind of a meaning. And, and scripture certainly is life-giving, so I wouldn't want to deny that. Um, but he's saying that it has nothing to do with the actual origination of scripture or anything like that at all. Now, what's interesting is, you know, as soon as I hear that, uh, I'm like, well, we've got another book we've got to look at, <laughs> you know. Um, I've often said, I, I read the heresy so you don't have to. Um, that's, I don't get to read all the fun, neat books. I get to read stuff like this. And so, you know, you buy it, you order, it's always obscenely expensive, especially books like that. Uh, if it's published by Brill or anything like that, forget it. It's going to be $169 on the low end uh, for, for a book like that. Anyways, I track it down, and I start looking through it. <coughs> it's, it is scholarly. Um, and he's using a resource that I've used in my doctoral work in the past called the Soros Lingua Greci. It's an exhaustive catalog of all ancient Greek literature. And that is really neat to have. I mean, you know, you want to see how terms are used. And he's looking at how this is used, and there have been... Uh, sources that use the term that have been discovered since Warfield did his work. So, okay, that's, that's fair game. Um, but I'm working through it. I'm getting to where he's... It's one thing to argue the, the lexical information. It's another thing to argue the conclusions. And I start looking through the conclusions, and all of a sudden I realize... Um, <laughs> Let me give you one more background issue here. In 1993, the Pope came to Denver, Colorado, and uh, uh, World Youth Day was in Denver in 1993, John Paul II. I remember Rich Pierce and I went up there, and we spent like a week up there and passing out tracts to all the kids, and I did two debates with Jerry Matitix on the papacy, and it was a busy time. It was, it was fascinating. Um, Carl Keating and Patrick Madrid, the two primary people of Catholic Answers at that time, they're not any longer, we had challenged them to debate the papacy. They said, you know, we're not going to do debates while the Holy Father's here. We don't think that's appropriate. Uh, why don't you debate Jerry Matitix? And so we did, two nights in a row, seven and a half hours. But after, I, after we ranged out with Jerry Matitix, they set up a debate with a guy named Jackson and Nemec, two fundamentalists. And they had it on the same night that I was debating Jerry Matitix, one of the two nights. So I couldn't even attend. I couldn't even go. But I listened to the tapes um, later on. 
and it was a slaughter. It was, there should, there should be a mercy rule in debates. They're really, they're really, you've got it in Little League and stuff like that. There should be a, after about the 47th run or something like that, uh, you just shut it down. Um, this wasn't even fair. And, but I remember very, very clearly that, especially back then, one of the arguments that Catholic answers would always make against Sola Scriptura was, look, you don't even know, you don't have any way of knowing that Matthew wrote Matthew. The church can tell you that, but you reject that, so you don't even know that Matthew wrote Matthew. Now, unfortunately, the non-Catholics answered that by saying, but I turn here in my King James Bible and it says the gospel according to Matthew. And therefore, Matthew wrote Matthew. And it's like, yeah, well, the King James, 1611. Okay, all right. Well, anyway, um, not really a good response. And that's why I said it was that they needed a mercy rule in it. Well, here's, here's the funny thing. Well, it's not funny. I'm reading this book from this guy who's saying Theonustos does not mean God breathed. It means life giving. And when I'm reading the argument, argument that he's trying to make to, to get here and to make application, I realize, and he says it very clearly, he says, the author who wrote 2 Timothy, he doesn't believe Paul wrote it. He doesn't believe Paul wrote 2 Timothy. We don't even know who wrote it or when it was written. It may not even be apostolic. And I'm sitting here going, well, now, by the way, that's a common perspective. I hate to tell you that, but you go to a local Bible college, you go to local seminaries, and in most of them, not all of them, but in most of them, um, the pastoral epistles will be considered synonymous. That Paul didn't write for 2 Timothy and, and Titus. Now, if you go, well, why do they say that? Well, because it uses different vocabulary a, and B, uh, it shows a mature uh, formation of the church where you have elders and deacons and stuff like that. And we all know that didn't exist yet. Okay, um, so point one, they are stunned that private letters have different vocabulary than letters written to entire churches to be read in public. <coughs> Whoever giggled, I'm with you. <laughs> okay, because that, that's what I did in my classes at Fuller when I got hit with the same stuff. I giggled um, because it's like, wait a minute, don't you realize? If, if Paul, if, when Paul's writing 2 Timothy, this, he, he, may, he very clearly believes this is the last time he's ever going to communicate with this beloved friend. Are you going to use the same vocabulary, the same frequency of words in writing a personal letter to a dearly beloved friend as you figure your life's about to end than you used when you wrote to the Romans because you're writing, a, you're writing out the thesis of the gospel that you want to be distributed all over the place? Obviously, it's going to have different vocabulary and stuff like that. It's, it's absurd. But that's, that's what you get. And then the other idea, well, we, we know the early church wasn't like that. And how do you know that? You know that because you reject these books as representative, representative of the time frame in which they say they're written. If you'd take them first, then you would go, oh, well, actually what we see in Acts um, evidently took place. And wow, what we see in Revelation actually did take place. You know, the, the letters to the seven churches. And, and it, it's a circular argument, but what happens is in academia, Circular arguments just get repeated over and over again until they're accepted as truth. And in my experience, and my, I have good experience in this area, in my experience, when I debate theological liberals, they never read us. They don't think we have anything meaningful to say. So when I've debated theological liberals, when I debated uh, John Shelby Spong, the late John Shelby Spong, you know you're getting older when you start thinking about all the people you've debated, and there's now a whole list of them that are dead. Uh, you, not because you killed them. Um, <laughs> that didn't come out right. That's, that's, 
I don't, I, you know, but <laughs> it's just simply because I started doing this in 1990. And to me, 1990 does not sound that long ago, but there are some people in the audience that were not born in 1990. So um, that's, yeah, there you go. Anyways, uh, John Shelby Spong, when I debated him on homosexuality, um, uh, or Barry Lynn, same topic. Um, they had not read anything from my perspective at all. They didn't care. They didn't want to know. They didn't, had no interest whatsoever because they don't feel that we have anything meaningful to say. Um, Bart Ehrman didn't read anything I said, read, but that was primarily just complete hubris and, and uh, arrogance on his part. Um, so we read their stuff and respond to it. They don't listen to our responses. That's just, that's been my experience over and over and over and over again. And, and I've seen that happen. So back to this guy. He doesn't believe Paul wrote 2 Timothy. And that's going, to interpret, that's going to impact how you interpret the language of 2 Timothy. You can no longer put it into the context of everything else that Paul has written. That's going to impact things. And here's a Roman Catholic apologist. And apologists tend to be conservatives. If you're a liberal, you don't have anything to defend. So why bother? I mean, seriously. Um, ask Ken. He's tried to get liberals to debate around here. And, and Chris Arnzen tries to get liberals to debate all the time. And, and it is hard because they're like, why? Why should I argue about something? Because I don't really believe much about it either. It's, just sort of, it's, just, it's really difficult to do. And so it, it does impact things. And so it's shocking to me that Trent Horn would be utilizing a source like this. Because look, I've debated Sola Scriptura many times. And I've debated Catholic Answers people on Sola Scriptura. They never did anything like this before. Now it's a new book. But they never went that direction, they never argued that scripture is not theonustos. They never argued that that's not a unique thing. In fact, go back and, and watch the 1999 debate I did with Mitch Pacwa in San Diego. Um, he's a Jesuit priest, speaks, uh, reads 12 languages, a brilliant guy, really nice guy. Really, really nice guy. Um, and we debated Sola Scriptura. And there was, no, there was not even a, a, an argument about this. There is something unique about scripture and its nature as God breathes revelation. Nothing else is God breathes. Well, now the idea is people are trying to say there is other things that are God breathed. The church is God breathed. The, the tradition is God breathed. Even though we can't tell you what it, exactly what it is, can't give you historical evidence of it, these things are God breathed just like scriptures, scriptures are. So, back to the debate in Denver in 93. The huge irony is what Catholic Answers used to do is say, well, how do you know, even know Matthew wrote Matthew? If you look at the current members of the Papal Biblical Commission, you're given a five-year tenure on the Papal Biblical Commission. So you, you can be on it for more than five years, but it has to be renewed by the Pope. So Francis has been Pope for, I think, 10 years now. So everybody on the Papal Biblical Commission, either he put them there or he has approved their continuation on the Papal Biblical Commission. Now, I can't verify every single one of them, but I've been able to verify especially the English speaking and reading and writing ones. Nobody, I don't believe anyone on the Papal Biblical Commission of the Roman Catholic Church believes that Matthew wrote Matthew. I don't think a single one, and I can prove to you, it, you can go to the, the, the New Jerome Bible Commentary, one volume Bible Commentary, it's not cheap, but it's you know, yay thick, forward by Pope Francis himself, with the imprimatur and inihil abstat, which used to mean something, it used to mean this was someone saying there's nothing heretical contained in this, in this work. And you look in there, and it is the most progressive theology and interpretation. Matthew didn't write Matthew. Paul didn't write 2 Timothy. That's Roman Catholic scholarship today. That's where they are. So it's, it, but you see, the, the, the apologists were always on the conservative side of these things. If they start buying into Roman Catholic scholarship, they're not going to have much to say, to be perfectly honest with you. 
um, I, 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 I think there's a crisis heading for them. Because right now, you need to understand the Roman Catholic Church is in crisis. And we will be impacted by it. Let me just say this in passing. Not, well, you may have noticed I have no notes. <laughs> then again, I normally never do, but uh, especially uh, this evening, I don't. Um, this crisis will impact us. If you've noticed that especially as we're dealing with fundamental issues in our society, such as what is marriage, what is a child, what is a man, what is a woman, um, there has at least been somewhat of a coalition with Roman Catholicism on these issues. And certainly they have a long history. And in fact, we have to admit that when it comes to the pro-life issue, they were in it long before we were. Um, we just didn't know. We just didn't even see it coming. And for, man, for a while, you know, in the early 70s, a lot of Southern Baptists were, were supportive of abortion. Um, because it, it, there was just no information about it. it, was just, it, it there was no, there had been no moral theology, developed moral theology on the subject, which is a shame when you think about it. We're catching up. Um, and so, uh, Francis, very clearly, in fact, <laughs> I won't mention any names here because I do not want to get him in trouble, but I have a friend um, who is a Roman Catholic priest. And we are friends and we talk and we talk honestly about all sorts of things. And he sent me a uh, tweet this afternoon from The Guardian, and it's from James Martin S.J. Now, just, just off the top of this, just my own, my own interest here. Does anyone in this art, uh, audience know who James Martin, Jesuit priest James Martin is? Nobody. Okay. He held his hand up. I saw him holding his hand up. So you're, you're familiar with what he's... I'm sorry? I didn't realize you were asking for a kid. I misunderstood what you were Oh, but I saw someone back here. So are you familiar with who he is? This man here. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Give me, um, in, in some sense, favor of LGBT. Yes, yes, yes. As a Jesuit priest, he is the head of organizations promoting LGD, LGBTQ plus uh, inclusion within Roman Catholicism. And Francis is very supportive of him. When they're having conferences, he will send a papal letter hoping that they have a blessed time and so on and so forth. And very, very supportive. Now, do you know who Bishop Strickland is? Bishop Strickland from Tyler, Texas was removed by Francis about a month ago. And the primary reason he was removed is because he opposes LGBTQ plus inclusion, so on and so forth. He's a conservative. He gets kicked out. Martin gets promoted. And so here is uh, from The Guardian. Did Christian homophobia come from a mistranslation of the Bible? A new documentary challenges an alleged 1946 mistranslation that helped lead to a justification for Christian anti-gayness. That was posted by James Martin S.J. Now, it's the 1946 movie. Do, how many of you know about the 1946 movie? Okay. I have talked about it from its inception, before it was even recorded. Uh, we've provided a lot of refutation of the uh, trailers that were released. I've not seen it yet, and I don't think it's available for seeing yet. They're only doing it at film festivals and stuff like that. Um, but it's the absurd argument that the RSV Translation Committee introduced homosexual to the Bible uh, and that it doesn't accurately represent what, ar rep represent what arson equites means. Have we done one just on homosexuality? I think we did. And so I've gone through all of this stuff, uh, obviously, many times before. Um, but here is what my Roman Catholic priest friend said. James Martin is promoting this idea 
uh, that most likely is BS. <laughs> I know you're traveling, so I don't know if you would see it, but if you do have a spare minute, you might want to reply. I bet people would see it. He said, considering Pope Francis has given him almost a universal platform, I'm sure that's why he feels comfortable talking about something that is literally stupid and being able to get away with it. Um, and so I, I haven't had an opportunity to respond to that yet and comment on it yet, but I'm, I'm going to. Um, but Francis, as you know, last month, the Vatican, and this is partly because of what's happening in Germany, there was functionally a schism with the Roman Catholic bishops in Germany because they are insisting on the right to bless same-sex unions. And the Vatican has said as late as 2021, can't be done. Now, in 2023, as of a month ago, there is a pastoral exception. And the idea is, and, and this, the statement basically is, as long as you, you don't make it look like a marriage, you can bless a same-sex union. <laughs> Any of us who have watched what has happened in the mainline denominations over the past 40 years recognizes this. It's one little incremental step at a time. And there is currently a synod on synodality taking place in Rome. It met again, it finished meeting about a month ago. And all the conservatives that were there came out of it going, it's really obvious what's happening here. The people that were given the opportunity to really speak were browbeating us about being homophobic. There, there was a recent uh, article I saw from the New York Times, the Vatican allowing transgenders to be baptized in. Yes, yes. That, that, that was about a week after the other one. Uh, that transgenders, transgender individuals can now be like godparents. They can be involved in baptisms. Um, yeah, so Francis plainly is supportive of Martin. He's doing this type of stuff. He's not well right now. He is changing the way that his successor will be chosen. Not only has he stacked the College of Cardinals, forced the conservatives to retire, and so that everybody in the College of Cardinals is his acolyte, someone who thinks and has his theology. They're the ones who will be selecting the next Bishop of Rome. But he is also, it hasn't been formally done yet, but he has floated the idea and the documents going around of bringing in for 25% of the vote lay people and women. So not just the Cardinals. Cardinals only get 75% of the vote. Now, by the way, up until the 1050s, the Bishop of Rome was always chosen by the people of Rome. He was a popular vote. So for the first thousand years, that's how it happened. So this College of Cardinals, white smoke, black smoke, blah, 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 uh, mail-in ballots and stolen elections. Uh, <laughs> that's... That's all new stuff. Um, so, so it's not like there's a, it's not like you can say, oh, he's changing a dogma. No, he's not changing a dogma. This is how they've done it, and he's, he's, he's got the right to do that. But there's a reason why he'd be doing that. And that is to, to cement the church into this trajectory that he wants that, that church to be going in. And you need to understand something. Um, that will impact us in courts of law. If Rome collapses on this, if Rome, if, if you see 10 years from now um, same-sex marriages being blessed by the Vatican, um, not only do I think that might cause some schisms within Rome <laughs> um, and some, um, I don't even know what would happen uh, within Rome, but it will have impact upon us in further minoritizing our position and pushing us out to the outside the extremes of society. 
legally and in, and in many other, other ways too. You just gotta recognize that's happening. And my argument right now is real, is real simple. There is nothing that the believing conservative Roman Catholic who still holds the theology of the Council of Trent can do about Francis because you rejected Sola Scriptura. You, you, th th this ship sailed a long time ago. There was a brief period of time when Rome played with what's called conciliarism. The idea of the supremacy of councils over the papacy. Anybody remember when that was? Anybody here when we did the church history thing the last time? Okay, here's a quiz. Oh yeah, right. That's that's gonna. I don't even know how many years ago that was. Um, I'm sorry. It was. It was at uh, what you had happen uh, immediately prior to the Reformation is called the Babylonian captivity of the church. And a lot of people don't know this, but the papacy moved from Rome to Avignon, France in the 1300s. And then what happened over time is a schism arose where you had a pope now back in Rome and you had a pope in Avignon. And for decades, they busily anathematized each other. <laughs> and for primarily political reasons, various of the nations would line up with one of the two popes, but for political and military alliances primarily, not because of any massive theological reason. <laughs> well, this was a scandal, obviously. And so a council was called, the Council of Pisa, which deposed the first two popes and elected a new pope, but the first two popes refused to go along with the council, so now you have three popes. <laughs> which only make things worse. So finally you have the Council of Constance. All the other popes are deposed. One pope is put in place. Everybody agrees to it. The papacy goes back to, uh, to Rome. And that's the same council that then burned Jan Hus at the stake. So that's right at 100 years prior to the beginning of the Reformation. There was the opportunity. Obviously the papacy was incapable of healing itself. It needed a council to do it. So now the idea was raised, well maybe that's the ultimate authority that we can look to, is not to a pope because there had been a lot of abuses of the papacy and um, the pornocracy in the, in the 10th century where the, the office was bought and sold and there was a brothel in, the, in Rome and all, it, was, it was a mess. Um, you know, a council, a multitude of voices, you know, there was the opportunity. The papacy very quickly moved to quash the idea of conciliarism. And that led over the next couple of hundreds of years until finally, you know, in 1870, you have Vatican I and the establishment of the infallibility of the Pope. Which, by the way, is actually relevant to our subject. Because we talk about scripture as being infallible. We talk about it being inspired, ultimate authority. I've debated the infallibility of the Pope twice. My Roman Catholic opponents took completely different perspectives in defense of that dog dog dogma. One tried to defend the bishops of Rome that even Rome has said were heretical. So you have Honorius, Bishop of Rome, who for 400 years Every bishop of Rome that became the bishop of Rome, when he ascended that throne, he had to anathematize by name Honorius as a heretic. 400 years that happened. And then in 1870, yeah, but the pope can never preach or teach heresy. Except Honorius did. Well, we're just not gonna think about that. One guy defended Honorius's orthodoxy 
the other guy just went, yeah, there are heretics that have been Roman Catholics, popes, but their heresy could never become established in the church. Here's the point. I cannot think of a dogma that is more useless than the concept of papal infallibility. Because here's how it works. The Pope is infallible except when he's not. <laughs> and you have no way of knowing in your lifetime whether he, what he's teaching now will be considered infallible by future generations. It's like when you lived in the days of Honorius, if you believe what Honorius taught, you would have been wrong. But you wouldn't have no way of knowing that. And so the application today is the Bishop of Rome is infallible in what he teaches. Except when he's not. And when he teaches something wrong, he wasn't teaching it to lead the church astray. He wasn't teaching it in his office as the Pope. And how are you supposed to know that? You'll figure it out. Your grandkids will. But it doesn't have any meaning to you. So it's worthless. It's, it's, a, it, it's, it, it's completely empty. And right now, there's a lot of Roman Catholics who are being, quote-unquote, red-pilled that are going, yeah, uh, I'm sort of glad that doctrine really doesn't have much meaning to it because Francis is making things look really, really bad for us right now. So there is a crisis. And the German bishops may keep pushing. And I don't know what the next pope's going to be like, but there are, there are really no conservatives left in the College of Cardinals, which choose. By the way, it doesn't have to be chosen from that group, by the way. It doesn't even have to be a bishop. There's a lot of ins and outs there. Hey, Trump might get it. I don't know. It's just... <laughs> Wouldn't have ever thought of something like that in uh, 23 years ago, but now it's sort of like, well, you know, um, they wanted to make him Speaker of the House, and, and, and oh, oh my goodness, who knows? Um, yeah, if Trump doesn't get in next year, then, then maybe uh, papacy's next. I don't know. Um, but uh, anyway, so that crisis is there. And I say that crisis goes to a fundamental foundational denial on Rome's part of sola scriptura. And this is what it leads to. It leads to the infallibility of the church. And the, infall the infallible church, therefore, is now in a monologue with herself. How do you hear the voice of Christ? How is the church supposed to function in the New Testament? Where does the church hear the voice of Christ? In that which is theonistos. But once you subsume this to your own tradition and authority... You're now in a monologue with yourself. There can be no reformation. There can be evolution. But reformation in the sense of being brought back to an objective standard is no longer a possibility. Because in Rome's, in Rome's position, and, and Roman Catholics, look, Roman Catholics will say, I am wrong in saying what I'm about to say, but I invite you to listen and, think, and, and decide for yourself. When we defend sola scriptura, we're always on the defensive. And you may say, well, you're doing that again in February. Yes, that's because I can't get anybody on the other side. Trent Horn was willing to defend apostolic tradition. The problem is that's a nebulous term that is not dogmatically defined by Rome, so you could make it mean whatever you want to make it mean. I can't get any of these guys to defend. Pope Francis is the infallible vicar of Christ on earth. When John Paul was the Pope, I would have been able to get 10 guys that would have been willing to do that. With Francis, no way. They know better. They know better. They're spending half their time spinning everything that he says. So they're, they're not going to go there. So when we defend sola scriptura, we're saying the scriptures are the sole and foul rule of faith and church. The Roman Catholic perspective, I call sola ecclesia, the church alone. And they go, no, 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 it's not the church alone. We have, it's the three-legged stool, you know. You've got scripture, you have tradition, and you have the magisterium. It's a three-legged stool, and that's how you keep balance. And then, Okay, all right. Let's think about it for just a second. Who defines what scripture is? Who has the power of canonicity? Well, the church does. The magisterium of the church 
is what determined dogmatically the canon of Scripture. Anybody know when? 1546, April of 1546. That's not all that long ago as far as church history is concerned. Um, who gets to interpret Scripture infallibly? Well, the church does, but this is somewhat of a slippery slope too because you ask most Roman Catholic apologists and they'll say there might be like seven passages of Scripture that have been infallibly interpreted and many others will say, yeah, not any really at all. I mean, they'll minimize the target as small as possible. You'd think after 2,000 years that inspired commentary would be really useful, you know, the dogmatic one that tells you exactly what every passage means, but it doesn't exist and it'll never exist. But they do claim that final authority. So, so they determine what is Scripture and what Scripture means. And then when you talk about tradition, I, I remember the, the first time I, in a debate, um, and one of the things we did do, and I'm thankful for this, uh, you know, I listened to a number of the debates that Jerry Matatix and Scott Hahn were doing with, like, Calvary Chapel pastors before we did our first debate in 1990. <laughs> And nobody ever challenged them on history at all. And so when I debated Jerry on the papacy at City de Lourdes, a Catholic church in Tempe, Arizona, in January of 91, I think, um, there were Catholics getting up and leaving. They were so upset because they were not accustomed to, being, to having church history used against them. They thought it was all theirs, and it's not very plainly and very clearly. And, but I remember, I was, I was, it was debating Mattatix on, on Long Island, and I quoted a particular church father, and his response was, yeah, but that's not tradition. So they get to choose, even from the same church father, what words are tradition and what words are not. So if you define what tradition is and what tradition means, you define what scripture is and what scripture means, how can that be an equal leg in your stool? You're determining those things. The church is the final authority in all these things. And once you make the Pope the infallible vicar of Christ, above any council, you're stuck with Francis. <laughs> You got no way out of it. It's a, it's, it's a design flaw in your system. But how do, you, how do you reform that? The system cut off the only option and the only source of reformation a long, long time ago. And that's what a lot of people are having to look at today. And I feel for them. I'll be perfectly honest with you. I have a lot of respect. There's a, you know, I, I see these people online that are conservative, believing Roman Catholics. And I respect a conservative, believing Roman Catholic more than I do any liberal, any leftist who's just sort of wishy-washy about everything. Um, but I feel for them right now because if they're, if they're really honest with themselves, they should be able to see my church is marching into apostasy. It's marching into heresy. And there's nothing that can be done to stop it. Um, it's um, a good time to be proclaiming the gospel <laughs> uh, with clarity. Hey, guess what? Um, are you the blessed man? That's what I always say to every Roman Catholic. Are you the blessed man? And of course, we've done Roman Catholicism two or three times as well, I would imagine, over the past uh, quarter century. But all that coming back to, after 40 minutes, uh, all that coming back to, I would imagine that first presentation, if we were to go back and listen to it, that I did at least 20 years ago here, would have been very much focused upon issues raised by Roman Catholicism. How can it not be? I mean, you look at our Confessions of Faith. You look at the Westminster, you look at the London Baptist Confession, Savoy Declaration, whatever it might be, and our Confessions of Faith, the very language is... Um, in so many of those sections is determined by the Reformation. Um, you read what we have about the Lord's Supper and stuff like that, and there will be specific references to Rome. 
uh, denial, both in the Westminster and the London Baptist Confession, that you do not have in this another offering that is uh, uh, propitiatory to God. And that's talking about the Mass. So, you know, we, we can't avoid that reality. That, that language is there. The history is there. That's where we came from. And so I'd imagine that first presentation was very heavy along those lines. But what's really interesting to me, and we'll sort of start wrapping up with this, what's really interesting to me is when Ken got back to me and said, let's, you know, Van wants to do Solo Scriptura. And I'm like, uh, okay, I, I think I can, think I've done that before, yeah. Um, one of the things I started thinking about was what can we learn by looking at the difference between the first time we did this and now, where we are now. Is the Roman Catholic issue any less of an issue today than it was then? Well, it's become a little bit of a different issue. And I have said many times from behind this pulpit that as Western society becomes more and more fully secularized, we and the Roman Catholics are going to be pressed more and more into a smaller cultural space, which means we will be having much more interaction with each other. And most of us, if we're not former Roman Catholics, um, certainly from what I've been seeing online recently, there's been this explosion of debating on Roman Catholicism, and I'm watching Protestant arguments, and I'm going, okay, well, I thought I had sort of explained that before, but um, uh, wow, our arguments haven't kept pace, and theirs haven't either. I mean, it's the same issues we're arguing, um, but there's good arguments, and then there's bad arguments, and the good arguments were what the reformers were doing, and the bad arguments have developed since then, sadly. Um, and, and so, but as we, as we are pushed into a tighter and tighter space, we're gonna need to be making decisions about what is really truly important. Um, some of you know uh, that the church that I'm a pastor at now, Apologia Church in Mesa, Arizona, my uh, fellow, one of my fellow pastors, Jeff Durbin, fairly well-known young fellow, um, that you don't want to mess with, by the way, being a former uh, world champion in karate, um, and still works out. So um, don't, don't, don't mess with Jeff. But um, even though I, I'm loving the fact that if you're watching, if you watch any of the sermons from Apologia, the bottom of his beard is turning white. <laughs> I just love it. You know, because they're always talking about, you know, Pastor Luke is always talking about how you know, the only reason Pastor James knows so much about church history is because he was there, you know, and <laughs> they're, you know, uh, Jeff's 16 years younger than I am. The other ones are even younger than that from me, and it's just so fun to see Jeff's beard turning white. Uh, now, why it's turning white might be another issue. Um, I mean, the man's burning the candle on both ends of the blowtorch. He really, truly is. Uh, but our church is the home of an organization called End, Abor End Abortion Now. And uh, Jeff, for example, in January, this last January, I preached three out of four Sundays because he was out of town. He was testifying in states all across the United States for bills, the abolition of abortion, in legislatures. And um, you may have seen we dropped a huge uh, documentary last Friday called The Fatal Flaw. And I won't go into the issues about that right now, but um, uh, even though it had implications here in Missouri, I think Ken saw it, so you know what I'm talking about. But one thing that we've learned for a long time is that we go, when, when we go to abortion mills, it is a gospel situation. We're bringing the gospel to bear. And we think that's the only answer, is bring the gospel to bear. And that means years ago, 
the people that began to oppose us outside the abortion mills were the Roman Catholics. They're there, but they will not proclaim the gospel. They will not say to women that are going in that they can have forgiveness in Christ, that what they're doing is murdering, and hence they need to have forgiveness for that commission of murder, uh, that, that Christ is the one who commands them not to do this. They won't do any of that. But they will stand in a circle and pray the rosary. And they are offended by the fact that we are pleading with these men and women, these husbands and these wives. So uh, husbands, wives, boyfriends, girlfriends, it's, it's a mess. Um, but we are pleading with them. And we are telling them that Christ commands them to not shed innocent blood and that they will stand before him. And they, just, they, they are just so offended by that. And so that... That difference in understanding of what the gospel actually is, what the gospel message is, uh, has had an impact even in that area. And it, it, it also has the impact, I noticed, um, was it Strickland? I think it was Bishop Strickland. Um, he did an interview. He was the one that the Pope removed from Tyler, Texas, the conservative guy. He did an interview last week about why he was removed, why he feels he was removed, and so on and so forth. And fascinatingly, he talked about the synod and synodality, the promotion of LGBTQ stuff in the Vatican, things like that. Um, but in passing, he made a, he, there was a specific sentence where he affirmed the perspective of what's called side B Christianity. Now, if I say the side B position uh, in the homosexual debate, how many of you feel confident that, you, that you, you know what I'm talking about? And how many will go, yeah, I'd like a definition of that there. And how many of you just sat there and go, it's too late, I'm not putting my arm, I'm not doing it. I don't care what he says, uh, he's gone too long and I'm not participating. Um, <laughs> Um, did any of you see the debate that I did in September with Dr. Gregory Coles? Okay, about 10-15% uh, of you. Um, I did a debate in uh, Pennsylvania, uh, I think it was Mannheim, Pennsylvania, with Dr. Gregory Coles, uh, who works with uh, Preston Sprinkle and the Center for Sexual, faith, sexuality, something along those lines. Anyways, and it was on side, the side B gay Christian position. Um, and so Gregory Coles is a self-professed gay man, gay Christian, who is celibate. So he does not believe that he can marry, and he does not believe that he can engage in homosexual activity. Now, it's interesting, a lot of people start out side B and end up side A. Uh, so, for example, I debated, um, oh, he wrote the book called Torn, Justin Lee, in, uh, I think it was 2013. It's hard to remember these dates anymore, but I think it was 2013, I debated Justin Lee, and at that point, he would have been pretty much side B, and now he's fully side A and is married to a guy. So there's a, there are people who stay over there, but they don't really stay over there for a long period of time. Anyway, we did a debate on that subject because from their perspective, homosexual desire itself is not sinful. It's just a temptation. And I disagree. I think it's disordered. Um, it's like saying pedophilia is not a sinful desire. It's just a temptation. You just may have the temptation to it, but that doesn't mean that, as long as you don't act on it, it's okay. Um, I don't think that's the case. Um, and we did a full debate on that subject. What's interesting is that's already pretty much the official position even of the conservative Roman Catholics in the leadership of the church, because Strickland, who is a conservative, there's a whole sentence in this article where he affirmed the side B perspective. So, what does all this have to do with wrapping up? 
Okay, you can't get version 2.0 of this. There's, there's no updating. I mean, every single day, every single day, if I click on the App Store, there's that little red number that says, these are the number of apps that you need to update, you know? And it, sometimes it's three or four times a day. You could, you could run an update, and they're constantly updating things. And that's what young people are expecting today, and they look at this, and how do you, how do you get the 2.0 version? And we have to recognize that's a, that, that's a, a real thing. And the only answer that I can come up with is if we recognize the nature of what this is is completely outside our experience of anything else. And I think that the only people that are going to hold firm, especially when it's going to start becoming very costly to not go with the narrative. And there may be people sitting in, in here right now that it's already cost you. I understand that in so much of uh, business in America, holding to a Christian sexual ethic I already know people who've lost jobs and positions and advancement and everything else for not being a jerk, just being a Christian. But it's going to cost more and more unless God in his mercy arrests this society in its mad dash for self-destruction. I mean, I leave that prayer open. But let's just be honest, you look at Scripture, and generally, how has God done that in the past? Through judgment. Great judgment brings repentance. And I've got five grandkids, and I don't want them to go through war, invasion, societal collapse, depression, starvation, famine. I don't want any of those things for my kids, my grandkids. But I also know... God's perfectly just to bring judgment as he sees fit. I mean, I hope there's nobody sitting in here that doesn't realize we have blood all over our hands. Not just the aborted children, but children that are at eight years of age are injected with puberty blockers so they'll never have a normal life. Mutilated by, by surgeons making mega bucks. And let's be honest, I know I was raised to think that, you know, just... You know. But there are people in this country, in this nation, that love war. And they profit from it. And they seem to want to keep it going and going and going and going. There's blood on our hands. And the idea of national repentance, <laughs> really, that's what we need. And I say the only people that are still standing firm, even when the wheels come off, and they're wobbling really bad right now, even when the wheels come off, the only people who stand firm are the people who believe that this is their unchanging standard. And it's not just, it is, it is an intellectual conclusion they've come to, but it is a heart commitment that is born within them by the Spirit of God. It's got to be both. It's got to be both. And my concern, it cannot simply be a traditional thing. It can't just be, well, that's always what I've believed. It's got to go beyond that. And so what's interesting to me in conclusion here is that as we look at Sola Scriptura this time, yes, Rome still remains relevant. Eastern Orthodoxy is relevant. The religious aspects are relevant. But I don't imagine that 20 years ago there was much of an emphasis in what I had to say about the sufficiency of Scripture to, to allow us and to equip us and to drive us and empower us to be salt and light in a dying society. 
I don't think that was much of the emphasis. But now, I don't know if any of the rest of you have seen this, but are you seeing the stories coming out of China about disease X? Yeah. Oh, just in time for the elections. And I keep, I keep telling, you know, I was at G3, and I can guarantee you when I was on, uh, I'd be up there with all the, all the big guys, you know. They all flew in. I drove in from Phoenix, because most of you, I think most of you know, I don't fly anymore. I'm, I'm in an RV park about uh, 16 minutes that direction, and we've purchased a 35-foot RV. My big old honking diesel truck is sitting right out there, and that's how I get around. And people go, you're weird. And I've just always sat back going, you just wait, you just watch. And I'll say to those guys at G3, when you're not allowed to fly anymore because you won't take some no noxious poison or you know, put some, something on your, your face, uh, y'all give me a call uh, if you want to know what kind of trucks to get, what kind of vehicles. You know, I'm, I've pulled about 50,000 miles now. I'm starting to, Kenny and I have been trying to get it. I've got a circuit out on my, on my RV right now. And so there's some plugs that aren't working and, and Ken's put two uh, GFIs in it since I got here and uh, we haven't fixed it yet. And uh, I'm finding other ways. I think you, you've got some uh, extension cords for me out in the car. Good, I got some extension because the, all the plugs in the back work. So you just, <laughs> just run, run an old one up there and do it that way. Um, that's just, hey, RVing is adapting and surviving. That's, uh, that's what the whole world is, but that's what I'm doing. That's how, I, that's how I'm gonna be traveling uh, because these people that, that want our freedoms, they're not done yet. Uh, COVID was just the start. That was just the start. They're going to they're, they're gonna be back, and they're just ramping up. So how are we going to respond? And I think that's where the difference is now, because the question, the, the, the question of the sufficiency of this in dealing with doctrines in Roman Catholicism, okay, that's one area. How many of us really believe that this is sufficient to give us the principles to interact with a society that has adopted the culture of death. That's not an easy question to answer. And the reality is we're behind the eight ball. We are, we are, we are behind in catching up. And so sufficiency of scripture is not just a theological issue, now it's become a life issue. It really has. So, um, I didn't bring a wear a watch tonight, so this is, it's a hair pastor freckle. Um, <laughs> come on, that's an old one, if you're laughing at that one, wow. Um, so, the schedule for tomorrow is uh, donuts at 9.45. Did you catch that, Ken? Okay, donuts at 9.45. Uh, session at 10. Uh, lunch. Um, at various places around the area uh, until 2. Please try to do as much caffeine as possible if you can. Please also remember, caffeine will kill me. It, it really will. Um, you, know, you can laugh, that's okay. Go ahead, and laugh. Go ahead and laugh at my heart condition. Shall we talk about my arthritis now? Okay, fine. So 2 o'clock... As a Baptist, I'm, I genetically fall asleep at 2 o'clock on Sundays and any other days. So the 2 o'clock session is hard. I have to do cartwheels across here. I have to do all sorts of things uh, to try to stay awake. It is very, very difficult. But we have a 2 o'clock session, uh, and then we break, a uh, lengthy break for dinner, and we're back at 7 uh, is the schedule tomorrow. So that actually leaves time for you to you know, go do some other stuff if you want to do other stuff. Uh, but the sessions are at 10, 2, and 7 um, tomorrow. And I think once I get past like 62 years of age, we got to cut the afternoon one out because I just need a nap. <laughs> just, just, you know, that, that's the best way to do it. So, uh, but we will uh, press on tomorrow with topics such as the nature of inspiration. We got to touch on canon. Why don't we have 74 books? Uh, why, why only 66? And uh, some stuff on the historicity of the Bible and stuff like that. 
Uh, I will have my Jeffrey Rice Bibles down here. Um, if you, uh, I will be keeping a close eye on them. They have GPS trackers in them. Uh, and uh, if they disappear, uh, we will hunt you down. And, uh, uh, but uh, let's, uh, let's close our time with a word of prayer. Thank you for being here this evening. Our great Heavenly Father, once again, as we have considered uh, weighty and challenging issues, we would ask that you would just use this to focus our minds and our attention. We want this time to be one in which we are challenged, in which we grow, when we go back home, that we will be better servants of yours, that we'll be clear thinkers and speakers to those around us. And Lord, that we will grow in our confidence in the fact that you have spoken to us in your word. May we, like the psalmist who wrote the 119th Psalm, be consumed with our trust that you truly have spoken that you have given us light in the darkness. May we grow in our understanding. Use us to bless your people. Give us traveling mercies even now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.